from Toronto, Phantom Media presents the Not So Corporate Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Not So Corporate Podcast. I am your host, Mark Drager, and here with me in the studio, I am joined by, is that the correct way to say it? Mm-hmm. I, someone sent me an email. Actually, my mom. My mom sent me an email correcting my grammar. Is it I'm joined with or I'm joined by? I think it's by. She, she's going to email. She's going to say, well, I emailed you the correct way to say it, but my phone is crashing on me, so I can't figure it out. Anyway, I'm joined by Leah Earl, who is a digital content producer here at Fanta. Hey, Leah. Hello. And also joining us is Louis Vizenios. Yeah. Louis is an editor here at Fanta. That's yeah. Right. And he's joining us because today we are talking about wedding video production. Now, it's not something that I actually have a lot of experience with. Um, I've only ever shot one wedding, and it was early in my career, and I did a pretty bad job at it. But uh, Louis spent a number of years uh, shooting videos and editing videos for weddings, and he has more experience with that. And it's something that is, you know, potentially maybe looked a little bit down upon uh, within our industry. But the reason why we're talking about it is because we have the person who I feel is the the very best wedding producer in the world. The guy who was doing the very best wedding work that that I that I've seen any other house produce, any other production company produce. We are having him on the podcast today, Patrick Moreau from Still Motion. He's going to be on a few minutes with us um, from Portland, Oregon. But before we get to Patrick, I want to take a few minutes just to catch up with the guys. I like to always do that. Um, you know what? If you are listening and you like this catch-up time, you let me know because Lee and I had a conversation about this this week. And I said, should we cut the catch-up time? Does anyone care about us catching up with each other? What's going on? Or do they just want to hear the, the raw topic? And your position, Leah, was that people like to hear us talk. I Honestly, I feel like I like to talk about this. You like to talk? Because I, I have had some people say maybe it's a little lengthy, this catch-up time. This catch-up time. <laughs> so maybe we should but cut it down. Someone yeah. who is listening, uh, email us or tweet us and let us know if you like this catch-up time or not. You're already wasting your time listening. Waste your time <laughs> and send us an email. <laughs> They're not wasting their time. They're not wasting their time. Now, Louie, I'd like to catch up with you because last time we spoke, I hadn't uh, seen any of the Rambo series. and um, That's right. And, yeah. and since then, I, I watched all of them. I watched all three in a weekend. So First Blood, First Blood 2, and Rambo 3. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, they are spectacular. Rambo was a book. Yes. Before it was a movie. Yes, it and, was adapted uh, to the screen. That's right. And um, the book is very different than the movie. Rambo is like a killing machine in the book, and, and he doesn't really kill it. I don't think he kills anyone in the movie. Uh, well, he throws a rock at a helicopter, and a dude falls out of it. Okay, but... And then yeah. um, he he lights a gas station on fire by driving a truck into it. Yeah. And then, you are you know what? You may be right. He may not actually directly kill anyone. I don't think so. Yeah. Because he's got a... But, but you know, I, I haven't read the books, but who knows how likable he is. The book is, like, trying to draw, like, more of a gray area between, um, like, military patriotism and... You're, um, you're really deep, man. You're really yeah, deep. I know. It's crazy. We're delving uh, deep c- into the Rambo series. Yes, considering what I wanted to do was I was just looking up my favorite quotes uh, from Rambo. Okay. So, so you Let's and I went that. back and forth a little bit. And so this is from Rambo 2. So, okay. so you know, uh, First Blood 2, if you remember, he has to go um, back. He has to go back to Vietnam. And he has to um, try and see if he can find any prisoners of war. And he meets he meets a young lady who's going to help him go back there. And our, our, our good friend Rambo says says this to survive war you need to become war and that's pretty deep it's super deep. that's some deep shit yeah now uh and <laughs> and then um then, then later in the movie he's able to blow up wooden complexes with <laughs> with a bow and arrow which is which is i mean i know he had detonators on the end of it uh, detonators on the end of it but to blow up wooden complexes with with it's pretty a bow and arrow is yeah. pretty amazing that's I, a skill set that not many people have other than john rambo now what i'd like to see happen is i'd like to see rocky fight rambo <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see what happens there because Rocky's an idiot. Yeah. Rambo's incredibly smart. Who do you think would win, Leah? Again, just so. I don't know. Bra- uh, brains over. Sorry, brain. sorry. Okay, let's get Leah. Would win. Let's get Leah engaged Rambo in this. Leah, how's your son? How's your baby son uh, doing? Let's talk about sick. something you're he's engaged sick. with. He's sick. Yeah, he has an ear and throat infection. Fun times. Yeah, that's super fun. Yeah. Yeah, worst. Was that a worst topic? Let's talk about. 
What's wrong with Rambo? No, it was great. Yeah, it's a good intro. Just got to cut all the Louis. I like you're just you're you're say, the words coming out of your mouth are not matching the expression <laughs> that's on your I don't, face. I haven't which seen says, Rambo, and I feel like I don't oh, have time to it's watch on Netflix, it. Netflix. Do I have time so to watch good. it? Yeah, yes. Is it worth it? Yes, Rambo yeah, one. Well, it's We've worth discussed it. this before, but is it scary? Because I don't like no. when movies are no. Scary. Okay, Rambo one is very very good. He says he says like eight lines in the whole thing, and seven of those lines are in the very last monologue. Which is like, which is very, very good. So what, what you're thinking that will like? It holds up. Wh- it totally holds that up. That I will yeah. want to watch a Action. movie if there is no lines. No, because because listen, you know, Sylvester Stallone's worst character trait is his voice, <laughs> right? So the fact that yeah. he can just do his thing kind of without having to hear it too very much. Very cool. And and the cops, the guys who play the cops are really good actors. Yeah. And some of the stuff the guy pulls off is crazy. Rambo's All cool. Right. First Blood, not First Blood 2. Don't waste your time with Rambo 3. <laughs> Unless if you want to see Rambo defeat a helicopter, as you mentioned, with a tank. He drives a tank yeah. into a flying helicopter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, good stuff. He does do that. All right. Okay. Good stuff. So I'm so envious of time. you, though. Why? For, for experiencing you, it for the first you get time? To, yeah, you get to go back and like watch all these movies that I... You know, that I watched, you know, when I was like 13, I guess. Isn't yeah. there? I only saw Star Wars when I was like 14 for the first time. What? Were you like Crazy. raised by wolves or well, something? Well, that's the thing. Like we didn't grow up like fundamentals or like, you okay. know, like I didn't grow up in a household without TV or anything. I watched The Simpsons right. growing up. We watched okay. lots of stuff growing up. We didn't watch movies. I didn't grow up in a family that watched movies. I had a VHS tape of Daffy Duck's Fantastic Island, but I watched that every single day because it was Looney Tunes. So Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, All good right. stuff. When we were little, we rented the same movie like over and over again why would my parents why would my parents not have just bought it every time we went to the video store we're like we just want to rent the chipmunk adventure and they were like fine (laughs) oh because that's the devil's playground young lady what is wouldn't isn't that something your father would say no he subscribes to this now eh? yeah he would he's very supportive bill how's it going buddy (laughs) 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 mr bell sorry mr bell i hope you're you're doing well (laughs) you should call mr bell you're like my age (laughs) That's what you call people. I suppose so. Do you have your kids? Do their friends call you like Mr. Drager or Um, Mark? My 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 kids' good friends call me Mr. Drager, and I say, no, no, don't call me that. That's my dad. No, I don't really. I I just just you just do whatever their parents say, because no matter how much you like, they're trying to instill respect into their kids. So if they want to call me Mr. Drager, that's fine. They don't have to. Usually, they just say like you know Rachel's dad or Jonah's dad, because even if they know your name, they're really not sure. How to approach you? That's an interesting thing. I feel like you know, I, it's it's. I don't want to be Mrs. Earl. It's more. <laughs> you don't want to be Mrs. Why? Like I don't want to be called Mrs. Earl. I'm still oh, married. You, no, you totally. You like you totally will when when your kids are like teenagers or something. I think out of respect, but um, you know, like I wouldn't go over to my friends. Like my best friend growing up, his name was Jordan. His mom's name was Cindy. I would never say like even as teenagers, 16, 17 year olds. Hey, Cindy, how's it going? Like it's very rare for me to use a name because it's just yeah. you don't have name confidence. I don't. I don't have name confidence. I've because no. ter- I'm terrible with names. Oh yeah. I can like so. <laughs> so here's the thing. I can meet you and I can be like Leah. Her name is Leah. Her name is Leah. And then I would go to say like, Hey, how's how's it going? <laughs> like because I'd be like, Well, what if it's not Leah? What if it's Leah? What if yeah, it's you like freak out? Yeah, mm-hmm. and I start to have a little mm-hmm. mental battle. Mr. Bell, we appreciate you listening. Thanks so much. And Mr. Earl, who has an MBA, we appreciate you listening yeah, to and all your friends. Yeah, he's listening. We won't have time to talk about MBAs this week, but one day we might have him on the podcast. To talk about an MBA. Yes. Or stocks. Well, I'm thinking or we're going to do a special limited, brewery? a special um, Desperate Housewives edition oh, yeah. of the podcast. We That's talked about that, right? That's going to be a good one. Look That's forward good. to that. Yeah. 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 But before we ever get to the Desperate Housewives, we're going to talk weddings. Because I guess before you can become a desperate housewife, you have to get married, right? Is that a good segue? That's a good segue. You do, yeah. Come Louis on. just got married. Yeah. Louis just got We're married. We're both right. married. Two months ago. Yeah. So. Right. I got married 10 years ago. And yep. you did your wedding video this year. So that's perfect. <laughs> Real <laughs> right. fresh right. I've in done, your mind. I've done two wedding videos in my life. It's One true. of them was my yeah. own and it took 10 years. I wonder how that, if that's how long it takes to actually deliver a wedding video normally in the industry. We'll ask. We'll find out. Okay. So coming up in a second, we're going to have Patrick on to talk all about weddings. So as I mentioned, we are joined with Patrick Moreau from Still Motion. Uh, Still Motion is a is um, a video production company. Is that how you'd say it, Patrick? Or do you classify yourself with that? Or are you guys filmmakers? 
Oh, it's such a it's such an interesting long winded explanation. But in general, we are uh, filmmakers. We do production. We also have our own original side. So we do our own web series, uh, and we uh, did our own documentary last year. And then we have a whole education side that's focused on really helping uh, storytellers and filmmakers. So we're really kind of three pronged in that sense. So super big video focused, film focused, educational focused company located in Portland, Oregon. And um, you have a bit of an interesting story that took you down to the states. Uh, many of our listeners are Canadian. Canadian as as well as American, but you originate out of um, out of Ontario, close to Toronto. Is that correct? Absolutely, uh, out of Midland, Ontario, a small small town uh, about an hour and a half north of Toronto. And so you found yourself just just so I can build your backstory. You know, we did a bit of research on you, of course. Um, you you found yourself in university, and the story that that I've heard is that you and your wife got together and decided to start making films. And you found yourself moving towards wedding videos. Why did you uh, gravitate towards weddings versus is, you know, what other people are doing, maybe more going into, into unions or going into commercial work or, or other things like that. Both of our background was in psychology. We were studying psychology and really wanted to use film as a medium to kind of express the things we were learning about. Um, so, I mean, imagine a university kid in a, you know, a dorm room that has never picked up a camera before. Amina had some photo background, but we knew nothing about video, never shot anything. And so the idea of like making a documentary, like we didn't know what story was. We didn't know um, anything beyond shutter aperture and ISO. Uh, and so that's what, that's what filmmaking was, is it was this, this medium to express some of the things we were learning about and things that we wanted to say. Um, and as a university student who doesn't have a lot of money and has student debts and everything else, what's the best way to buy gear? Um, for many of us, that's, you know, that's how we get into weddings. You know, it's, it's the, the kind of easiest gateway into filmmaking where you can actually kind of get paid and bring in some money and, and help kind of get your gear. So that was really our, our motivation was we wanted to be able to do documentaries and weddings were going to kind of uh, help us uh, sharpen our teeth a little bit and help us buy gear. Um, and because of that, we weren't trying to make the best wedding films. We really didn't have a desire to make wedding films. We had a desire to tell stories and to say something. So we really didn't w worry about or look at what the industry was doing. Instead, we tried to just kind of, we, we really just tried to do something that we wanted to watch. Um, and that was always our filter. And I think that that's often what um, many of us forget. It's just like, is it even interesting for me to actually uh, view? And as we started doing that, people started taking notice. We started kind of getting um, some really interesting attention and a lot of people were kind of looking at our wedding films and uh, that's really what started us on this crazy journey. Um, and then all of a sudden, weddings actually took over. And, and uh, rather than pursuing a PhD, we were business owners shooting 40, 50 weddings a year in our last year of university and decided to not, after finishing my bachelor's, not going any further with that and actually taking over and focusing on still motion. You know, I think there's a lesson in that and and it's it's interesting to me because so many people focus on starting a business for monetary reasons. You know, they think I need to make money, I need to hustle, people are pressuring me to do something with my life, I have to do something. And yet you found yourself going into film because of a passion. You found yourself ignoring what the industry is doing, ignoring what other people are doing and doing something for yourself and for your customers, something that that gets you excited and and yet that led to an extraordinary um, path and, and extraordinary growth. And, and you know, I said in the opening wh where you went on the line, I said, you know, I felt you were producing the very best wedding videos in the world that, that I have seen anyone produce on any level. And so it's interesting to me that you didn't go to film school. You didn't want to become a filmmaker. This wasn't uh, a stepping stone towards doing kind of, you know, what you really want to do. You found yourself doing weddings and videos, but but ignoring the world around you and doing because you're passionate about storytelling. That that to me is is really interesting. Our theses in university were on over justification and materialism. So we were very aware that pursuing money was not going to do anything for us in terms of our well being, and really finding something that we uh, loved and that could actually make a difference was going to be you know what actually makes a difference and um, statistically <laughs> correlates with with happiness. So. Uh, when we got into this, we, there really wasn't a drive to increase our rates or to make a ton of money or to do any of that. It was purely about making something that, that mattered to us and would matter to other people. And I think because of that, we, we really kind of were a lot more innovative. Um, and I think we had a lot more of like a growth mindset and we were bringing in new techniques and new ideas and all kinds of things because this was our passion. And I would say that, you know, uh, a pivotal point in our journey was when the NFL um, saw, you know, a group of Canadians wedding film and said, we want to see what you guys can do. Come out and shoot a playoff game. And uh, that wouldn't have ha had happened 
if our focus was on the business. <laughs> well, our we'll, focus was on charging as much as we can. We'll because, get, I mean, we'll get that, to the, the NFL. The wedding they saw wouldn't have even happened had that been our focus. We'll get to the NFL in a second because that's that's an amazing outcome for your story. But um, the other the other thing I wanted to uh, mention is the first time that I came across you was you were profiled by um, by a technology provider, uh, Cinevate, that you, that you were using their um, camera adapters because in the old days, for people who aren't as old as, as me or you, uh, you know, we didn't have the luxury of DSLRs or or exchangeable you know lenses you know off of a body. Essentially, you you bought a you know like a tape camera and then you would put an adapter in front of it to try and add a shutter, um, which would you'd lose you know a few stops of light and things like that but it would it would work to to create um, a cinematic feel out of something that's recording to tape um, I believe the first thing that I really ever learned about what you guys were doing was a wedding uh, I don't remember the couple's name and I couldn't find it but it was a wedding where um, uh, Josh and Laura who got married in Mexico and yes it was an Paul Brevis wedding how do you know that with, that? The, with, the, awesome. with the fire crazy. in the background right there was like there were people there was yeah, like flames it was Amy night Seeley. and then yeah, you cut her, to her it beautiful soundtrack yep how, how do you know well I guess you remember which video was profiled or are you reading my mind right now uh, it, 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 I I remember things. <laughs> it, I, I think uh, when your story goes deep with people and who they are, and it's you know kind of more original as opposed to shooting everyone the same way, uh, it's very easy to remember. So uh, that was a, a, a team effort to shoot entirely Brevis, and, and like you said, they were um, lovingly referred to as like bazookas, like they were just massive, massive gear. I think people who start in DSLRs today have no idea how hard it was to shoot with something that like literally you could hold for five minutes and your arms got tired and you'd often try and shoot things with like a tripod. It's just like, like imagine showing up in the morning and shooting with a tripod. You were so slow and obtrusive and obnoxious. Well, we, crazy. Used, to, we used to shoot corporate with a Red Rock and I think we would lose three to four stops of light. So imagine, imagine like shooting an interview setting where you'd be bringing in HMIs and other stuff just to get enough light in order to shoot an interview uh, on one of these systems. But but uh, those are the old days that are behind us. But what, so so it's amazing to me. You uh, you know you remember that it was a fantastic it was a fantastic film and and that really you know I looked at what you were doing. We were doing corporate and I said I you know gosh we got to up our game. We got to get better. These guys are doing this in weddings, and so there was that. I was watching what you guys were doing. But the other thing is. From what I heard, from what the internet was telling me, you guys were charging like twenty thousand dollars plus for a wedding video. Now, that's that's you know when you Google how much does a still motion film cost, that's what it was saying. So, so you well, know, people I, Google that. I googled that's it. Amazing. I want to know how much people, yeah. <laughs> how much you were charging. But then, but then you found an answer. That's what's crazy. Um, yeah, I would not always trust the internet. It's been it's been known to mislead people in the past. Um, and yeah, that that was definitely high. Uh, that would be high for what we were charging at the time. We were probably closer to ten to twelve thousand um, dollars, and then near the end, we probably charged closer to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. With the higher ones being uh, forty to fifty. Okay, so so even so, so you know, people listening might be saying, you know, I'm, I have trouble getting twelve hundred dollars out of someone, or I, I have trouble charging three or four thousand dollars out of someone. So can you walk me through? Um, you know, not in excruciating detail, but just just the selling process, the selling mindset. Your portfolio speaks for itself, which is great. But still, you have to not not convince or sell, but you have to be aware that you know the productions cost twelve to fifty grand. How is it you're producing at the time wedding videos for twelve to fifty thousand dollars? How are you approaching it? How are you speaking with clients? How are you potentially selling it? I think the, the whole concept behind it was that we should make art, not fashion. And I think that so many of us get into this and we try and make fashion, right? We try and follow the trends. Everybody's using drones right now. In our time, that was Brevis and then it was DSLR, shallow depth of field, then it was sliders. You know, and there's, there's these trends that people hop on and then doing ring shots and dress shots. And hey, we were, we were huge, um, huge at the forefront of that. And, and uh, I feel really bad for encouraging that behavior in others of like just shooting kind of meaningless details to try and make them look beautiful. Um, but that is fashion, just trying to make it look pretty without any uh, depth behind it. It. And so what we really moved towards was making art, making something that actually said something and was unique and original to the people. And I think that, well, you know, any of us could walk into an art gallery and we could see a painting hanging on the wall for $10,000 and we might not consider buying it. Um, I don't think that we're going to walk in and go, can I get that for $500? Because my friend down the road, he uh, he does a painting and, and he has brushes like yours. Can I get that for $500? Right? There's just there's a different perception around art. There's a different respect around art. And uh, th that allowed us to naturally attract people 
who wanted something that was more artistic and that was original to them. Um, and so a big part of what we did was we just showed the work and we really expressed that this is about creating something entirely original for you. Um, our handmade boxes at the time said something along the lines of, this is a story that nobody else could have written but you. Um, and so like when you got your film, that's, you know, that was the message. And that was always the idea that this was not a cookie cutter. It was not a formula. It wasn't about the wedding day. The wedding was a backdrop. It's about who you are and what makes you different and what we can say that much, that's much larger than the wedding day. Um, and so the people that, that got that, um, were totally okay with the rates. I remember doing a wedding in New York for Michael and Crystal. Um, I hope they don't mind me referencing how much they paid or what they told me, but too late now. So Michael and Crystal paid about $35,000 to have us film their wedding, uh, just a video. And we did a same day edit. And, you know, Michael and Crystal had come in thinking that they would spend $10,000. They flew in from New York. They were really excited. They loved our stories. And they had spent a week planning their, or they had a week of events leading up to their wedding because it was just so important to them and they had so many details and everything else. And so while we were having dinner with them, which was a big part of us, you know, really getting to kind of know who people are, um, I mentioned to them that it's kind of crazy that so much of their story is the week leading up to it. It's not the wedding. The wedding is the result of everything they're doing. And they just had so much happening. And it was in this really small town, Terrytown. Um, so it was really neat that, like, he was going to pick up the ring down the road. And, like, everything was right there. So I said, like, you know, your story is the entire week. We need to have a team of people there for an entire week. Um, which, of course, then means, like, we're going from $10,000 to $35,000. Uh, but I can remember that process, that conversation, which was very honest and uh, candid at dinner and, and, you know, obviously very excited about the story and then sending them an estimate two to three days later of like, you know, here's what $35,000 gets you in a wedding film. Um, and within 24 hours, they were like, absolutely. And they're not, you know, extremely well off or anything. So this is not like that. This didn't make a difference to them financially, um, but made the decision right away. And then uh, the thing that I'll never forget is we did the same day edit. We spent the whole week with them. We did the same day edit, And he said before we left, like, if you don't deliver anything else, it was totally worth it. The experience of being with you guys and what you did and what you, you taught us about ourselves and how your storytelling process really goes deeper and then what you shared with us tonight, like if you didn't deliver anything else, we feel unbelievable. Um, and that's $35,000 for three minutes. It's pretty, pretty special. And so I, I mean this with all due respect, but who are you to tell someone to spend $35,000? And like, I, I, you know, who are you to say that you can make a film? Who are you to start a video production company? Who are you to step up into that role and say, this is what it costs to do what we do and this is how we do it? And I only ask that because I know that if I, if I were starting my career, I would say, well, that's good that you do that. You have clients with money. You have experience. You have these things. I don't have anything. So... So did you have those doubts, you know, like, or was it blind confidence or like, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as, as the business owner of you putting this together, were there doubts or did you just come in with full confidence and, and could other people replicate your success? Well, people, other people have replicated our success. Other people have found their own paths to success that are uh, greater and different and all kinds of things like that. So um, were we foolish? Absolutely. But I think foolishness is what leads to really amazing things. Um, I think we were smart in our foolishness, uh, but we, we definitely weren't looking to do something that everybody else was doing and just no interest in doing that in any part of our, our lives. Um, and so it was about really kind of doing something that mattered. And, you know, we didn't go from $500, I think our first wedding was for photo and video. We didn't go from $500 to a $35,000, you know, wedding film uh, overnight. It was a series of probably four to five years and being very strategic and stepwise and kind of thing. Uh, and, and I think pursuing the money was never about trying to get more money. It was about getting more resources to tell a better story that like we wanted to really get to know you and like have more people there and like really go deeper. And you can't do that for $2,000. And that's really how we even explain the pricing. So I, I think it certainly is very repeatable. And I think that, uh, you know, the story of the the NFL and what they saw and, and every single inflection point in our journey really comes back to just, you know, doing stuff that we were really passionate about that, that stood out there. And the reality is that the, the barrier to access today has never been easier, right? I mean, there, there's nothing stopping any one of us from pulling out our smartphone, telling a really amazing story and broadcasting it to the world in the next 15 minutes. Then that is, was never before possible. You could even throw it on, you know, Indiegogo or Kickstarter and get the world to fund your movie. You can distribute it with Tug and put it in platforms without having to put a penny down 
You know, you could have a film shot on your phone in your pocket broadcast across the world without having to put any money out. Uh, and, and that's never, never before been possible. And I think then what it really comes down to is the quality of your ideas, of your stories, of creating something that people want to watch. And uh, yeah, we can all do that if we care about it enough and we dig deep enough. So you've mentioned the NFL twice. So walk me through, for, for those who aren't aware, how it is that you transitioned out of doing weddings in St. Catharines, Ontario, or in Midland, Ontario, but how you transitioned from there to, what, doing stuff for the NFL and, and being in the States. Early on, Canon saw one of our weddings, a wedding we did for Amy and Alex. It was one of our earlier weddings that like got quite a bit of views. They didn't know what we were shooting with. They called, um, and they were like a couple blocks down from our studio at the time, and they said, hey, what are you guys shooting with? And it turns out we were shooting with uh, the XHA1, I believe, um, and a Brevis adapter. Um, but the fact that it was a Canon camera at the, the, you know, at the core of it made them really interested. And so they wanted to come in and see about, you know, using the footage or having us consult on a commercial. And they were doing a commercial for the T2i and they loved how, you know, the, the real emotion in the wedding. Um, and as it turns out, they ended up licensing the wedding, made it a primetime commercial um, across the country. So like we were watching Grey's Anatomy and House and like here's our actual raw footage from a wedding um, turned into a T2i commercial. I walked into a Best Buy once and like every single single TV like was flipping like th with the bride putting the veil in front of her face and like was a shot from a wedding we did it was just unbelievable and that started our relationship with Canon um, so then when they launched the Canon 7D they shipped us two white boxes in advance uh, no manuals no directions they said here you've got 72 hours test it out let us know what you think and at, at that time, I was supposed to shoot a photographer promo. So I went uh, and basically, you know, told the couple, I'll do this for free. Um, would love to shoot it. It's a prototype camera. Uh, so I don't even know if it's going to work. You know, like I can't guarantee anything, but l let's see what we can do. And they, they loved the idea. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to be at the wedding. They weren't even going to get video. So like this was a bonus for them. And it meant that I had absolutely no restrictions. I only had myself, two bodies and like four lenses, but absolutely no restrictions. And so that film was JC and Esther. And that was our first film that, that really went what I might call viral um, and got, you know, 250,000 views in the first couple of weeks. All of a sudden, we're getting a, a bunch of attention from nothing other than our weddings. And one of the people that saw that wedding was a, a big burly dude from the NFL. Um, and it's exactly like you imagine it on TV, where the phone rings and you're like, no. No, <laughs> like there's a mistake, right? You pick up the phone and when they said it, they were from the NFL and they wanted to talk to us about, you know, doing filmmaking for us, them and flying us to the playoffs. It was like, I, you, you know, the, the honest thing that went through my head was that it was Ray Roman and he was like playing a joke on, on me because that's like the kind of thing he would do. And I thought it was a little too far and it was a little too mean, but I actually didn't know what to say. And I felt like a fool if I took them seriously. Um, and it, it took 15 minutes to kind of get over that and actually start having a conversation. Um, and, and I mean, realize they're calling Canadians, you know, our game is completely different. Uh, and, and they literally had to like, you know, we had to teach people on our team who the quarterback was. Um, <laughs> come on, we got the CFL now. We have a quarterback. Our players have summer jobs. It's a different game. <laughs> They gave us one test test shoot, and they had no intent of airing it. They were like, look, uh, Chargers, Jets, you can bring a crew of three people, create a five-minute piece, tell the story of the fan experience. We want to see if the way you're telling stories in weddings translates to the game. It's exactly the same insight you had when you said you first came across Josh and Laura, right? Like, hey, we're doing commercial work. Look at what these guys are doing in weddings. Like, we can go deeper with our stories. That's what the NFL said. Look at what these guys are doing in weddings. Let's bring them in and see if they can shoot for us. Uh, and then that one shoot, um, they loved it so much. They never air aired it. Nothing ever happened. But they loved it so much that they ended up giving us a roughly 120-day shoot contract, you know, a several hundred thousand dollar agreement um, for a studio that, like, last week was shooting uh, garter toss and a cake cutting, you know, <laughs> just, like, unbelievably, you know, life-changing um, experience in a matter of weeks. I just, not to bring it back to weddings, but uh, so I shot and edited for 10 years before coming here to work for Mark in corporate video. While I was doing wedding videos, I, f I found that managing the expectations of a project so personal and that involved so many emotions was uh, very difficult. And I I'd like to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I think we go back to, to creating art versus fashion, right? If you went out and you commission somebody to create a painting for you and you said you wanted something for your home that was really you know fitting um, and warm and maybe reminded you of your cottage house or something like that and you hired them and you paid them ten thousand dollars to create this painting would you then go out and go but you can only use red 
you know, and here's the, you know, like, would you give them soundtrack suggestions and lens choices and all of, or in shot lists, you know, or would you say, no, you're, you're the artist. And if you understand me and what I want, um, then, then go and do it. And I think that that's where we, we fail so often is that we don't, uh, assert ourselves as the storyteller. We don't really, um, explain what the process is going to be and we don't really look at it as art and so people just step in and everybody's got an opinion on what you should you know what you should do and how you should do it so what we did um and this is probably later in our wedding career it took us a a while to get to this but um we just removed any of those decisions entirely and we just made them all so um and it it came from a very deep trust with our couples but we're like we're going to really get to know you and then we'll tell the best story we can um but we're not going to, I mean, at, at the wedding we shot in Florence, Italy last year, um, we didn't even have a schedule. They didn't even know when we were going to be where. There was no, like, nothing. You know, no list of how many cameras or how long it has to be. Or yeah. it, it was literally like, you know, you're commissioning art. Um, and so I think the more we can get into that idea of setting up a process, setting up expectations, and making it more about you being the storyteller and that you're trying to create something original for them, that you can get out of that. As soon as you're a tripod, well, then, yeah, I'm going to tell you where to stand and what to shoot, and everybody's got yeah. an opinion, and can you yeah. go get the cocktail hour for two hours, even though nobody, it's mind-numbing yeah. to shoot it, let alone watch it, yeah. you know? Um, so I think that's the problem, is that we really become tripods. And to get out of that, we have to actually say something unique. And then people start going, ooh, I, I want you to speak. I want you to you know, create something that is going to move my friends and everybody's going to talk about and they're going to share it. You know, I don't want something that you know, I'm going to have to beg and plead them to stay for more than 60 seconds. You know, uh, so uh, Patrick, I've, I've only ever completed two wedding videos. I shot one like right out of uh, film school. And then um, I got married 10 years ago and I finally edited my wedding video this spring. So, and it wasn't very good. But <laughs> no, it, <laughs> it was decent. It was touching to my wife, which is all that matters to me. But um, what I hear you saying is basically, you know, the troubles that Louis was facing on the production side of things was, was purely because of positioning and setup from the very beginning. It sounds to me like, like Louis' company was approaching things um, as, as, a, as a service-based company where they would come forward and say, you know, we will help complete your vision or... or uh, you know, we're going to do something to match your day or this or that. And it sounds like from the very beginning, you were positioning it very differently where you guys are coming in as experts, as professionals with the best interests of the client in mind to to see a new vision that's not, as you mentioned, you know, the wedding, the, the video isn't on the wedding, right? The wedding is the backdrop for the story of the couple coming together and you're creating a video on that. And just that mindset, that, that different philosophy will set up different um, expectations and different control and different procedures all the way through the production process. Absolutely. I think, you know, everything that you do really is integral to um, the experience and how people interact with you and the perception of who does what. You know, expectations are incredibly um, important. And uh, in, in Muse, we have you guys heard about Pearls Before Breakfast, the, the New York Times Pul- Pulitzer Prize winning article? No. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, sorry, some, I was thinking, some, should some, I should some I lie? Heard of it. It's 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 just it's so incredibly um, it, it's so powerful in showing really what uh, expectations can do. Um, so very quickly, what they did is they took Joshua Bell, and Joshua Bell is one of the world's best violinists, right? So you could kind of say that that makes him like one of the best world the world's best storytellers. Um, and so they take Joshua Bell and they take his million dollar plus violin, which is like taking you know one of the best filmmakers and giving him a red epic and a follow focus and cinema prime and like everything you could possibly want, right? So you take the world's best storyteller with this best gear and then they put him in, subway, in, in the subway in New York Monday morning, 9 a.m. They wanted to see what would happen. It was an experiment. And the crazy thing is that you've got one of the best storytellers in the world with the best gear and nobody noticed. 40 minutes before anybody stops. He makes like $40 in tips that day. You know, a guy that can sell out Carnegie Hall playing with a million dollar violin is making $40 in tips. Um, And it's the power of expectations because as you're on your way to work Monday in the subway, you are not expecting to to see or to hear that. Um, And so I think that there's so much insight and power into that uh, story and that uh, whole experiment they did that it's on us to create the right expectations for our clients about who we are and about what we do and what their role is and that we can't expect them to um, see Carnegie Hall if we create a subway. You know, it's on us to create yeah. that Carnegie Hall so that they can hear the music the right way, so that they can feel that experience. Um, and so often we don't. 
we, we try and create Carnegie Hall in our stories. We believe in them through and through, but everything else is a subway. And then we're so baffled why they can't see it and why they roll over us with changes. Uh, and I think it's about making sure that we surround it with that experience and those expectations so they can properly hear what we do. So you have this incredible relationship with your clients that makes this amazing work. But how do you do that over and over again? You said the, the one year you did 50 couples. Like, how do you keep repeating that process? Well, the first thing we did was stop doing that. <laughs> stop doing 50 weddings uh, okay. because it was getting very hard. And I think the moment that we um, stopped loving it, we stopped doing it. And that's kind of been a big that's been a big part of everything we've done, um, and a big part of our success really is is you know that all the, the st- staying passionate and really you know loving what we do because that's I think really the only way you're going to produce work that um, people are really going to fall in love with is if you really care about it. Mm-hmm. So uh, we started paring that down, and we went down to twenty to thirty weddings. We had multiple teams, all kinds of stuff like that. But I would not point to our fifty wedding years as where we were going um, the most in depth. All of that said, you know for the Twenty-ish thousand-dollar wedding we shot in Florence last year. Like it's not like we spent a month getting to know them or building their story. Uh, we go to dinner or we do some Skype calls. We you know share notes uh, with our team, um, and we have you know th- this uh, storytelling process that we call Muse that uh, we teach worldwide. And having a process allows us to be incredibly efficient in not just. Uh, in knowing what it is we're looking for, what universally makes a strong character. Forget a wedding. You know, you want to make a Hollywood film. You want to make a documentary, anything. You know, what universally makes a strong character. And that's where we dig. So we can understand what makes them a strong character. Uh, and then how do you build a strong story? You know, understanding the role of conflict and structure and all of that. So um, that is what we kind of go at. And we try and get to know who they are and what makes them different and these traits that make them a universally strong character. And then we build out the story. But that is often less than a day of work before we show up at the wedding. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but it's very, very intentional time, right? We know exactly what we're looking for, and then we build it into something so that we know exactly what the story is before we show up. We know that we're going to transition from a wide shot of the dad talking at a welcome toast with a kilt on to the you know night before when the bridesmaid was making fun of dad wearing a kilt because – We've looked at every single speech, every single toast. We know what everybody's going to say. We know their vows. Um, we know what's going to happen. And we're going to tell the story based on that, uh, as opposed to finding it in post. You know, we, we like to say that a remarkable story is written well before the cameras roll. And that's really our approach. Know absolutely everything before you show up, and everything else is easy. And so how do you force people to be that organized? I mean, I, I have participated in international conferences where speakers are supposed to have stuff in, you know, six weeks in advance, and yet the night before they're revising and changing and doing things and messing everybody up. How is it that you get some people who, who you know, are more focused on making sure the day goes well than they are on make, making a good video and, and, and being able to get them organized enough to give you what you need to do your job? There's a lot of different strategies on that. We can do a whole podcast just on how to, you know, organize brides and grooms to get the information you need for sure. Um, one is definitely trying to remove them from the process as much as possible and not make it a chore, um, right? So, you know, getting wedding planners and we, we would go directly to parents, you know, and ask about their, their speeches and their toasts. I remember for the wedding I was referencing with the kilt was Jess and Brian in Ireland. Um, and like I, I went and just chatted with their dad, Mike, when we showed up there. And like, hey, so you're going to say something at this welcome toast? And what are you thinking? And oh, I'm going to write it later today. Great. I'm going to I'm going to come check in on you. See how you're doing. Like it's that personal and real. Um, and, and so I think not making it a chore of the bride and groom um, and then two, really making it fun. You know, that's that was a huge part of it that it's not a it's, it's not work. What we're trying to do is build your story together. And we build your story by really kind of deeply getting to know you. Um, we use a process in Muse called keywords where we come up with five keywords and they really define like what this story is, what we want to say. Uh, and the five keywords for every story we do should be different if the story is different, right? Um, because every story should say something different. And so like that's a process that we actually work with with our couples and we'll share the keywords with them um, so that that is really the thing that they sign off on. Not when we're going to show up or cameras or anything else. It's the keywords. Uh, But it becomes a fun process that they want to help us to know them deeper. And, you know, the reality is if you go to psychology and just human connection, we all want to be heard. We we want to be valued. We want people to listen to us. The, the, The moment that that stops is when we don't think that you actually care about us. You just want information out of me, right? So you don't really, like, care about who I am. You just need to know when you need to show up. Well, I can put that off. 
But if you actually truly hear me and listen to me and what makes me different and what I dream for in my life, well, I'll talk to you about that all day long. Uh, so that is, that's where we go. We go deeper and we really get to know people. Um, and and it's, it's something that people don't do. And I would say that's probably one of the biggest reasons we were successful. It wasn't our work. It was our experience. It was that we really cared about people. Um, one bride in Hawaii uh, that I talked to, um, when I tried to ask her about Sunday, what she does on Sunday, a great question. We, we ask about Sundays and cookies um, to, you know, break the ice and get to know people. And she just didn't get it. She was like, what am I planning for the wedding tomorrow? Like, what do you mean? And what am I doing on Sunday? And it took five minutes before she understood that it was really about like, no, no, I just want to know like what's a normal Sunday for you because that's such incredible insight into who you are. Um, and I'll never forget what she said to me when she finally got it after five minutes. She was like, oh, wow, you actually care about who I am. It was so hard for me because everybody else I've been talking to, they just treated me like cattle. They just really wanted me to sign on the dotted line and then know when they had to show up and when it was going to pay them. So it's like I didn't understand when, like, that's not at all what you wanted to talk about. And, like, we have to realize that that's how people are generally treated by every single vendor. So if we can come in and actually, like, give a shit about people and actually ask them something different and care about who they are, well, I think, I think you can start to see how we're going to be okay paying them more, how we're going to be okay not telling them how they're going to do this, how we're going to be happy to show up and hang out with them, how we're going to give them more of our attention. You know, it just, it just makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it really speaks to the approach that you take. And I, I remember when when I was doing that, that line of work, um, you know, we had a questionnaire and we spent maybe 15 minutes talking to them about kind of running the day back from, from the ceremony or the reception and kind of planning things out that way. Yeah, I mean, you start to figure out with your model, the model that you employed, how much time you're putting into these couples and, and, and really why you're spending, why they're spending what they're spending. But Lou, yeah. were, were you asking, when you guys were doing your breakdowns, were you asking logistical questions? It was, see, that's the thing. It was all logistical. It was the thing that I guess Still Motion did was they, they took themselves out of that vendor circle and they set themselves apart and they empowered their, their, their clients. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to show up at 9.15 and... Make sure that uh, the dress is hanging so we can get a shot of it. It was more personal. And that matches the uh, the project because the project is so personal. And these people really do have stories beyond, you know, standing under under a hoop and getting married or something. We didn't make clients. We made friends. Yeah. We, we, we really did. We'd stay in touch after the wedding. We'd really get to know. I mean, we had a wedding couple we shot five years ago who just came and interned for us for three months. You know, five years ago, they moved from Australia to like – be a part of what we're doing. Um, you know, so we, we form very real relationships and that's how you get um, a completely different perspective. And, and quite frankly, that's also how you can, you know, shoot and get completely different, um, a completely different emotional tone in your story. Because if you're the photographer, I mean, or the filmmaker, you know, everybody is aware of what you're doing and they're trying to look good and sound good and everything else. But if you're a friend, well, then I'm just going to be myself. Uh, so really becoming a friend and getting like deeper not only makes the process easier before the wedding, but it also means that you can actually get a much deeper story because you're kind of on the inside as opposed to, you know, shooting that front that so often people want us to film. What are some of the biggest mistakes people make when they're shooting weddings? The single biggest mistake I think most people make is we... Uh, often create something that resembles like shit <laughs> that nobody yeah. would ever want to watch. Um, and I think that we, we confuse ourselves and we think that our job is just to make our couples happy. And we don't realize that that's kind of like being in kindergarten and doing a finger painting and bringing it home to your mom and she loves it. Um, that it's just, it's, it's not all that hard to impress people when it's their wedding. Um, right. and yeah. especially if you're making a romanticized version of their wedding. Um, so I think it's, it's going beyond that and trying to create something that is actually an engaging story, not just like a montage of beautiful shots. Um, and, and, and that's a hard thing for people to kind of wrap their heads around because so often we think that, no, 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 they're hiring me to like cover their wedding. They want me to document their day. I need to be a tripod. I have to cover everything. Um, and it's true that that is what some people want and if you're happy and your clients are happy then all the power to you but um, there's a whole other world out there where I think we, we actually tell stories and I think that we have to understand the difference between being a tripod and being a storyteller and when we're a storyteller we actually say something right we actually come up with and we choose the moments and we connect them intentionally to create a stronger emotional experience um, that is not a tripod you don't cover everything and call that a story that's a, a coverage of the day that's a documentary um, so 
I think it's choosing to actually, uh, if you want to say something, and, and going out and trying to ap- approach it that way and, and create something that you would actually want to watch, that your friends would actually share, that you could like post on Facebook, and people who don't know them would actually take something away from it. And when you remove that, uh, that crutch that we have of like, oh, but my bride loves it, which again is not so hard, um, all of a sudden you have to start understanding story well, don't you? <laughs> you have to understand what makes a strong character. You have to understand how to create a strong story structure. You have to find a way to hook people in because it's a wedding and it's not your wedding. So how do I make you care? Um, and I think that's the single biggest mistake people make is they don't understand that there is a whole other world where you can be a storyteller and that story doesn't mean being a tripod and covering everything, but it starts with really knowing and understanding story deeply so that you can do that. Um, and then once you can do that for your clients, nobody's going to want to go back. No, nobody sees an incredible story, an original piece of art. Nobody sees three, you know, th- a, a day worth of coverage distilled into three minutes that says so much more. It says, no, no, no. I want the really long, boring version that nobody will watch. I think one of the first weddings I shot, I had a bride who had come in. Um, it was uh, like a post-production consultation. And she had brought me a clip from another company. She wanted things in sepia and it had to be in sepia. And I was like, well, you know, we, we don't really do that here. And we, we like to think that our clients have the trust in us that we are going to produce the work that we produce here. And, and that's the reason why you hired us. Something happened very early on when we were teaching. And that was that um, people would ask us questions about, you know, why we're using the Steadicam. That was a big one. Uh, why we're using the Steadicam for that shot in the cocktail hour or the photo session. And we didn't have an answer. I mean, the, the answer, the reality was we were doing it because it was so boring. We were trying to make it interesting. And I think that uh, if a lot of us actually think about many of our decisions when we start in weddings, take black and white, take slow motion, take sepia take magic bullet and just slapping on a preset to make it look badass. Take a slider. So much of that doesn't come from a place of like, this is going to help my story. I'm trying to say something. It comes from a place of I'm bored. I'm trying to make it, you know, yeah. feel something. That's right. Go watch CSI Miami and look at like one of their lab scenes. It is so over the top glitter, right? Like yeah. the camera doesn't stop moving. The color is super saturated because there's so little substance that they have to try and keep you engaged. So I think when we don't do that, when we fail to have something that is actually engaging, well, then it's up to somebody else to pick it up and tell us how to. And if your bride isn't an expert in storyteller, well then, yeah, of course she's going to say, why don't you try Sepia? Why don't you try the soundtrack? Why don't you do this? Because you're both looking at something that's pretty damn boring and you don't know how to make it better, so good on her for at least trying. Um, So I think that's where it comes from. And I think that the more we can actually assert ourselves as uh, being intentional, as knowing what we're doing and having a solid reason behind it, the less people will try and tell us what to do. And I'd say that that's certainly true of weddings, but that was also true of us in commercial work. When we set up, this is what we're going to do and this is why we're going to do it. And then we show people that that's what we delivered. I mean, we do commercial projects that would get zero feedback, like zero changes, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 projects and not a single change. Um, and same with our weddings, like a, a change in our wedding was rare uh, because we set up what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. And I think that's where we fail. And that's where you get your bridezillas because we haven't set any of that up. We're back to the power of expectations and we're just back to having a weak story. And so, um, I would say tell stronger stories and you're going to attract people who want that and are going to step back and let you do it. If you don't have things that are engaging, well then it's it's fair game for anybody (laughs) to give you suggestions that are seppy and black and white and whatnot. The the way that I'm hearing your story, Patrick, is that your pursuit of story developed a business model and approach that constantly resupported that and and it was almost um you know it was almost like what what started out as a pursuit to create really engaging amazing stories led to all of these other processes and these other approaches and these little tricks that constantly reinforced your original intention of creating amazing stories most people want the story outcome without the dedication and pursuit of story, without the tips, without the tricks, without everything else. They want the outcome, but they won't, don't want to go about doing all the extra work to get there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it took us seven years to get there, um, but it was always about pursuing that passion and, and going deeper with every story we told. It's, it's very much Ira Glass's idea of the gap, right, where we, we, as creatives, we can see something in our mind that we want to create, but it's often our skills and our hands that can't keep up with that, and th- that creates a gap. That what we're outputting is very far 
um, from what we can see in our mind. And the real challenge, what he talks about, is that it's about persisting through that gap, putting in the hours, producing shitty work, shipping it, and moving on and keeping and getting better to close that gap so you can really start creating the things that, that you do see in your mind. Because we got into education, it was the single biggest thing that constantly pushed us to go uh, deeper with our work, to understand what we were doing, to be more intentional. And that just, you know, helped us take off like, you know, a rocket. Because all of a sudden it wasn't just like, you know, if, if you shoot corporate films or um, shoot weddings, I mean, how long did it take you to edit your own wedding? You know, that's because that's the lifestyle of most filmmakers. It just takes a long time to get through the backlog. But as soon as you start doing education, now you're breaking things down. You have to understand them. You have to explain them. And whenever you can't understand something, you need to then figure it out if you, you know, care about it, you're passionate about it. Um, and, and by figuring that out, if you go watch one of your commercial films and you analyze every single decision you make um, or your wedding films, and then you go, here's what I do know, here's what I don't know, you will be driven next time to make those decisions better, more fitting for your story. Um, and that's what education did for us. And so that helped us get to this process that we now call Muse, um, this thing that you know helps people tell much better stories with much more intention in far less time um, because we constantly introspected on what we were doing, on what was working, then compared it with like research and science and like human connection to understand why it worked. And that kind of iterative approach uh, got us here over just over a decade. And so what, what is Muse? I mean, I've, I've, I've checked out the website, so I have a bit of an idea conceptually about what it's about. But, but, but walk, walk the audience through what that actually is. Yeah, um, Muse is, is a storytelling process. So it's a step-by-step -step process that helps you be more intentional and more moving in your stories, create a stronger emotional connection. And it's really built on the four pillars of story, people, places, purpose, and plot. Um, and, and so we talk about you need to have a strong foundation, and any strong story maximizes all four pillars. They really have strong character, they have strong use of place, they have intention, they say something, and they have a strong plot to keep it engaging. And so what we do in Muse is we give you a step-by-step -step process to show you exactly what you're looking for at each step um, and what uh, and, and therefore, instead of you know taking the big ambiguous process of telling a story, making a wedding video, um, we're going to go, no, 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 let's just start with understanding what makes a strong character. Let's start with the big three things that every character needs, regardless of genre, that's going to universally connect. We'll show you some science on how human connection works. We'll show you how it affects our brain. But really, we're going to give you some simple concepts of that this is what you're looking for. Now, go look for that. Once you've looked at that, now let's get into place and talk about what place does. And now we'll talk about like how we can, what we're looking for in place. And so we work through it in a stepwise fashion, showing you what you're looking for, why you're looking for it, and universally why it helps you create stronger connection and be more intentional. And at the end of it, you've made a whole bunch of really small decisions that lead you to uh, a really powerful blueprint, a really powerful story. Um, so it really, it, it's, it's all about uh, being a much stronger listener and coming up with much stronger stories by going through this process in um, every, every story you tell. Uh, and it's basically a, it's an online platform is probably the easiest way to describe it, an online community. So there's courses, we've got quizzes and tutorials, um, you know, worksheets, but then there's also forums and ways that you can interact with uh, other musers, other people who have learned the process. Uh, because once you kind of have that same deep understanding of story, it's hard to hire an editor that doesn't get, you know, the proper structure of conflict in your narrative and where it needs to be. Um, so uh, that is what Muse is, and it's really a bringing together of storytellers who are passionate about doing what they do better and uh, helping other people do the same. Patrick, listen, thanks so much for joining us for the last hour. I really do appreciate it. Again, you know, I think I think the work that you're doing is fantastic. And, um, and uh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look more into to Muse as well because I think it's some of the stuff that you've mentioned is super interesting. One of the key takeaways that, that I have here is, you know, really it's not, it's not hard to impress someone that you're creating work for. But, but obviously your work stands out because you're not just creating it for the person you're creating it for. You're not just only creating it for yourself, but it's something that, that kind of goes global. That's something that's more um, obtainable by, by many people versus just the person you're trying to impress. Okay, so if you want to find out a little bit more about Still Motion, you can check them out on Twitter, at Still Motion. You can go to their website, stillmotion.ca, or if you want to learn a little bit about Muse, check them out, learnstory.org. Uh, now, they do have their courses running till the end of September. Uh, if you miss the cutoff for the end of September, um, you can catch them in January, and they were super nice enough to give us a promo code, so if anyone listening wants to check out uh, learnstory.org, which, uh, which is the URL for Muse, you can get $47 off the course by typing in the promo code code promo code 
promo code not corporate. Listen, thanks so much, Patrick, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a ton of fun. With this week's question of the week is me. I have a question, Leah. Are you going to let me do this? Go for it. Okay. I want to know from listeners the craziest story, their craziest bridezilla story they have witnessed. So whether you're doing film or video for weddings or not, maybe it's just a... You're just at a wedding. Maybe it's you're at a wedding. Maybe you're wedding crashing, like the movie with the wedding crashers. Yep. Yep. Maybe it's a family or member. Maybe you're Holland. Italian yeah. or Greek, and maybe you have a big family. Yep. I would like to know what the craziest thing that's happened to you at a wedding is, bridezilla-wise, or, you know, so for my wedding, for example, my wife and I, here's an example just to prime the pump, yeah, so to speak, I like right? This. My, my wife and I uh, released doves. It was, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> no, 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 hold on. It wasn't, it wasn't the doves that was the crazy part. The doves were cool. The, the crazy part was... Did, re- was Seal playing during the <laughs> Dove release? Just no, asking. someone read a poem and then we released Doves. Listen, we've been, we've been lovingly married and it's all because of what the Dove represents. Peace, harmony, and love. No, we released two Doves and the crazy thing is is the music's playing you know like they're like you're walking you release the doves the ceremony's over you're walking away yeah. we're we're walking like down the aisle and the dove lady approaches me and says i need to be paid and i didn't have any i didn't have my wallet on me i didn't have any cash what? i didn't have anything and i said i said well you have my credit card number we put the down payment she said no no i need to be paid right now <laughs> we're walking down the aisle she's like you owe me three hundred dollars so i turned to my best man and i was like dude i don't got my wallet on me i don't have any money you need to find me three hundred dollars right now to pay the dove lady <laughs> And so he's like, I'm on it. He was a great, my brother was super, super good. He was my best man. He's on it. He's like, I'm on it. Jesus. But he didn't have any cash on him. No. So he started to shake down people wedding. in the wedding party <laughs> who happened to have cash on them to borrow money. To Take cover. money out of the envelopes. Well, no, we didn't. No? We didn't do okay. that. But he. Uh, yeah. But anyway, we were setting up for a photo, and he was down, like down on a lower level, and his fa- his father was folding them into paper airplanes and oh flying him hundred dollar bills, so he could give the money to the dove lady. That was the craziest thing I think I that happened. I can't believe she did way. that. That is mind boggling. <laughs> I have so many stories. Well, you so just, many. You stories. just got married, right? Yeah, but I I just like because I was in the business for so long, I have seen things, my friends. I just um, I want to go back to that dove lady. Okay, were, you, were the doves inside? And then she were, got them back. They were, they were in a cage. So she released they fly them inside home. the yeah, church, yeah, yeah. though. No, no, we, no, no we, we had an outdoor wedding. Yeah. Okay, so she so, released them so, outside. No, no, they hand them to you, and you walk. Yeah, you, 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 you do it. You carry them, yeah. and you pinch them kind of tight so they don't fly out of your okay. hands, and you let go. And as you let go up to the air, they fly. They, they're like homing pigeons. They fly home. They fly back. So she's like, okay, my doves so are gone. the doves are flying my home. bitch better give me some money There you right go. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like it's not but like down the aisle. As this guy's coming down the aisle, she approaches him <laughs> with this money. That is crazy. <laughs> Pretty much. We were, that is yeah. crazy. <laughs> we, yeah. were, we were on a set. We were, yes. Yeah. So, right. So, quote, bitch, give me my money. That's pretty much what she did. Yeah, and Rihanna. she shook us down. Uh. I like that. I did not know that reference. I don't listen to music apparently either. Uh, well, you like, don't listen to that give music. me my money. I like Neil Diamond. Yeah. Yeah. We had some like Neil, Neil Diamond, Diamond playing yeah. earlier. But yeah. anyway, so we want to know from the audience, please, that was a bit of a ramble, but let us know the craziest thing that's happened to you in, in, the, uh, in a wedding. Anything crazy thing you've seen, you can leave it in the comments if you're listening to this yeah. on YouTube. If you're uh, listening to this on iTunes, feel free to tweet us at Phantom Media or send us feedback, feedback at notsocorporatepodcast.com. We want to hear your story and then we'll share them on a future podcast. Listen, Leah, thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. You are more than welcome. I, it was my pleasure today. It well, you great, produce it. So great you, podcast. Nice. Great podcast. Way to produce this great <laughs> podcast. Thank you so much for lining up Patrick for us. That was some good producing work. We got Patrick. We got Patrick. Yeah. That's heavy, podcast. heavy hitter. He's really good. Game Ooh. changer. Yeah, next He's week, really good. Um, uh, Don't Danny promise DeVito. What's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, we're going to have, we're gonna have Ro- Robert on. Robbie. De Niro. Oh, oh man. Good, good Robert one. De Niro. Yeah, so listen up next week when Robert De Niro comes on because it, this is part of the storytelling process. He talked I, about storytelling. Actually, We're going to have Bobby yeah, De Niro. Yeah, I actually feel like Robert De Niro is not attainable, but Danny DeVito might be attainable. <laughs> so, like, I feel like... He's in between projects. <laughs> no, he's yeah. always sunny. Come oh, on. Yeah, he's not... Right. He's, he's, so a, crazy. he's a producer. Yeah. And Louis Vizanios, thank you so, so much on, for thank joining. Thank you. Thank you. I fell down a well once <laughs> at a wedding. <laughs> I was I was like eight years old and I ruined my aunt's photo shoot because I fell down a well. I ruined my suit and I ruined the photo shoot. I don't, I don't did know. they have to call the fire department? Like, how did they get you out? Yeah, it was a shallow well. Okay. So he basically fell in a ditch. 
<laughs> Hold on, was this in Greece or in, no? This was here in Montreal. In Montreal, in Greece? you fell down a well. Yeah, it was a shallow well. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. (laughs) Okay. We'll see you. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. All right. Question of the week. Is Santa Claus creepy? That's the question we want our audience to answer to us. You press record after I suggested it, so I assumed you're on board. (laughs)